of our understanding <laughs> uh, of what it means to be a creative citizen, as well as how approaching writing with these methods at hand can shift and transform preconceived notions of what writing itself must be. Um, and with that, I will hand it off to Diane Natasha, who will do us the honors of introducing our first speaker, Liz Howard. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Brooke, and thank you all so much for being here. Um, to begin, we are going to introduce our first speaker, and that is, once again, our own Professor Liz Howard. Uh, Liz Howard is an Anishinaabe poet and writer born and raised in Northern Ontario on Treaty 9 territory. Her debut poetry collection, Infinite Citizen of the Shaking Tent, won the 2016 Griffin Poetry Prize, and her second poetry collection, Letters in a Bruised Cosmo, was a 2022 Griffin Poetry Prize finalist. Having studied cognitive neuroscience at the University of Toronto, much of her writing explores the connections of science, space, and poetry. These individual facets of her identity foster poetry that is unique in its presentation, offering intersections between her lives as a writer and as a scientist, negotiating the gap between science and humanities. In her poem, North by South, she writes that, sweet citizen, I know you as I know myself, a fictive province of selves within Doppler range, offering a view of the assembly of selves that exist within her person and within her work. In an interview with CBC, she states, reading makes its mark in you even at a physiological level. It sort of changes the activity of your synapses. Wielding that passion for literature, Liz is now the Shaftesbury writer in residence at Victoria College at U of T and is teaching this fourth year seminar on creative citizenship. Questions of creative citizenship are highly pertinent to her own work, offering a guide to ask questions of how we reconcile our innermost artistic desires with an external audience and world. Everybody, please welcome Liz Howard. Thank you so much, Di and Natasha. That was absolutely uh, generous and exceptional. And I'm just, I could almost cry. And I'm fiercely proud <laughs> of that. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to read four poems for you all from uh, my latest book, Letters in a Bruised Cosmos. And I'll begin with the first poem, uh, Probability Cloud. The universe broadcasts its lifespan in radiant heat. I need to believe my account will outpace its ending. A technical oracle, a feed that repeats itself, a reckoning. What I felt was complete disorientation. But the night crossed out sky is more than a map to read into the end and origin of everything. There is a guilt that folds into me like humanity, a darkness in the signal. A mark science confides is evidence of another universe, the collision of an afterbirth. If I continue, can I hold the body beyond its contact traces a violation and in intimacy? The palimpsest furniture of our specious present a succession of excess. I am here after all for decadence and silence. See this decadence, a bloom beneath the skin of my invitation, not truth, but surface, the hole in the sky. And this is Settler and Anishinaabe Kwe. Noli Turbare. Beauty is my irreparable eye. Today, I became geometric, a faux linear figure that distills a skip trace of first principles. In a whiteout of Atlantic snow, banging stars into the femoral vein of Euclid, while rows of lavender circuits, all porous, surrounded me. I genuflected before the hospital parking lot of my father's jaundice, for I am a good daughter of the colony, the colony which begot the immortal heart of the markets, resources nursed all young bucks of the florets, a liquidity I should service or else receive a lesser dessert. With my smudge cleanse at the ready, I find myself dispensing with the usual future haunt of resilience, a survival signaling my relationship to time, 
or am I out of it entirely? Come polygon and I circumvent the disaster. Do not disturb my circles. Holy, I went, holy all around my head. The holy I am went careening down the back stairs of this low rise rental, striated by the pinnacle light of this city that has my blood pooled purple at the center of its gravity. You can scan the ground from overhead for death pits. I read this on the internet when I was dehydrated, lonely, and afraid. Office plants became the broadleaf repositories for my cognition's faded heart. I've gone and been abominable. A column extended from the top of my head into heaven at the edges of my system, an Anishinaabek or Indo-European projection of words my nerves could translate into the crawl space of animal magnetism. White pine verticals send us up as a stomach pumped by filial love. Oh, inconsequent curb of my street, I refuse to kneel this day like any other. Plush pockets of rust about another falsehood of water a creek that pleats. I've gone and got a blister. That summer, the black bear's muzzle got coated in shellac from the aerosol can she bit through on my mother's porch at the edge of the forest. Four generations ago, my great grandmother said, don't ever shoot a black bear. They are my people. Makwa, Makwa from the North shore, before I continue to speak more than this, mortuary sunrise, where I'm only just alive. Buju, I mean, hello, today is over. And this is I dream in Gmail. PMS winter solstice, the hereditary gist of a fractal interior. I buried another yesterday by the back door of this expanding universe, just before I dreamt in Gmail. As if all new visions visit digitally, a reply all cri de coeur from Athens, a BCC promoted punk tour streamed via a cave system linked to the romantic history of strange quirks, spooky action at a distance. I slid down a snowbank into a northern stream, and then you smiled as if you like me now, now that my ass is wet. At midnight, that stream became the border between New France and my dream of being intelligible. Then I'm awake in the garage with my firstborn thought, a thought that sublimates into a braid of snowflakes. What could offer me an office in the February pension? A warmth that only makes its way into the deepest pockets. A novice love that can't help but become a flight risk. And I'll close with a short poem called Spring Letter. Uh, and just a note for this one, the word waboos is Anishinaabe Muin for rabbit. Spring letter. Waboos, tracking through the last of snow. Love is a root I stumble over in search of you. Geese fly backwards in my mind. A rewind that a stand of tamaracks sees just perfectly. There is no way to trap the anxious rabbit of me as my hide also reorders itself inside the brush of wide time. Thank you very much. And now group one, Maddie and Khadija will introduce Billy Ray. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Khadija, and uh, I have the honor of introducing our next speaker. 
Uh, Billy Ray Belcourt is a writer and a scholar from the Church Pile Free Nation. He has earned a master's in women's studies from the University of Oxford and Wadham College, as well as a PhD in English from the University of Alberta. He was a Pierre Elliott Foundation Scholar, which is awarded to an outstanding PhD candidate on the principle of engaged leadership. He was also a recipient of the Rhodes Scholarship, which is among the most prestigious scholarships in the world, and is awarded on the basis of characteristics such as moral force of character, an interest in one's fellow beings, and instincts to lead. He also received an Inspire Award in 2019. It represents the highest honor that the Indigenous community bestows upon its own people. Belcourt is an associate professor at the University of British Columbia School of Creative Writing, where his, re where his research interests include fiction, nonfiction, and poetry. Belcourt's debut book was released in 2017, and it's a collection of poems titled This Wound is a World. It's part manifesto and part memoir, and it discusses themes of love, sex, sadness, and hope. It earned the Griffin Poetry Prize, which made him the youngest person to earn the award. The Indigenous Voices Awards named it the most significant book of poetry in English by an emerging Indigenous writer in 2018, and CBC Books named it the best Canadian poetry collection of 2017. Indian Coping Mechanisms is Belcourt's second book published in 2019. Using various media such as photography and poetry, Belcourt discusses topics such as the political demands of queerness and mainstream portrayals of Indigenous life. His third book is a memoir in the form of essays and vignettes on joy, love, awareness, grief, and colonial violence called A History of My Brief Body, and it was published in 2021. Belcourt's latest book, as all of us in Vic 459 know, is 2022's A Minor Chorus, a novel that tackles existential questions of family, love, happiness, and storytelling itself. In class, we've spoken about the power of autofiction in the context of Belcourt's work, the blurring of lines between reality and imagination. And I just wanted to end off by sharing with you all the opening line of a poem called Autofiction that Belcourt published in The Walrus last December. How we exist in the world depends on how we describe it. And with that, I invite you all to join me in welcoming Billy Ray Belcourt. Uh, cool, <laughs> thank you so much. How does my audio sound? Does it sound okay? Okay, cool. I am using an old laptop because I lost mine uh, when I was traveling to Europe uh, last week, um, somehow, you know, still finding new ways to, to lose things. <laughs> um, but I'm going to read a couple poems from my first book and then two new poems. Oh, yeah. And uh, to start, it's such an honor to be here and to, to sort of read with and be in conversation with Liz and Josh, who are you know, two of my favorite people. Gay Incantations. I fall into the opening between subject and object and call it a condition of possibility. When I speak, only the ceiling listens. Sometimes it moans. If I have a name, let it be the sound his lips make. There is no word in my language for this. Sometimes my cookum begins to cry and a world falls out. Grieve is the name I give to myself. I carve it into the bed frame. I am make-believe. This is an archive. It hurts to be a story. I am the boundary between reality and fiction. It is a ghost town. You dreamt me out of existence. You are at once a map to nowhere and everywhere. Yesterday was an optical illusion. I kiss a stranger and give him a middle name. I call this love. It lasts for exactly 20 minutes. I chase after that feeling, which is to say I want to almost not exist. Almost is the closest I can get to the sky. Heaven is a wormhole. I first found it in another man's armpit. Last night I gave birth to a woman and named her Becoming. She has four Cree girls between the ages of 10 and 14 from Northern Saskatchewan. We are a home movie I threw out by accident. All that is left is the signified. People die that way. There is a dirt road in me. It takes you to a place like a reserve, but not 
because there are only Cree girls and no one is falling apart in a bad way. We are people who proliferate only as potentiality. Do not compare us to the rain unless you fucking mean it. Why did my love scare you? Was it too dirt road? What would you have done with a dirt road anyways? And two new poems. Uh, this one is called Preludes and it, uh, I, it's adapted from a poem I wrote in response to T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, which was commissioned by the Toronto International Festival of Authors this last fall. The one. Someone lied to us. The body isn't not a figure of speech. I don't want anyone's sympathy. I want a brief hour of rain between hookups, a plastic boat called grief wide enough to sink in. Nothing excites me as much as the possibility of transcending history. Somehow there are still so many kinds of light. Number two, once a psychic told my mother that I was going to get married, have children. Alas, I'm not immortal. All my sentences end in semicolons. Even death is a beginning. What is the subtext of my sadness? How do I live in the world if I don't love it? Many days I'm hysterical. I remember the wind and what the wind rustles through. A man speaks to me in a human voice. I try to admire what's left of the future, which flickers. And lastly, a poem called Subjugated Knowledge, which is partly about uh, teaching. When your subjectivity feels loose, let the world in. Study the subjugated knowledge of rain, I say to my students. No one understands what I mean. It is a kind of freedom inhabiting my own little sphere of nonsense ideas. I am incumbent mayor and red ant and total sunshine in the ridiculousness of my prairie consciousness. My people's homeland has been categorized as both prairie and subarctic, but it is actually a secret third thing. We need fewer anthropologists and more minor poets. Here's to the eros of an adjective, I yell. Here's to the golden age of having so little to say and too many ways to say it. My students nod solemnly. Silly man, I imagine them thinking. Does he know some people can only withstand a tiny bit of love? Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Billy Ray. And now uh, group two, Sarah and Angel, will introduce uh, Joshua Whitehead. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, Angel and I both are going to introduce uh, Joshua Whitehead, so I will begin. Um, Joshua Whitehead is a two-spirit OG Neho member of the Peguis First Nation Treaty One. He is the writer of the best-selling novel, Johnny Appleseed, which was long-listed for the Scotiabank Giller Prize, shortlisted for the Governor General's Literary Award, and the winner of Canada Reads and Lambda Literary Awards. Whitehead is also the author of the poetry collection, Full Metal and Digiqueer, and the book of creative nonfiction essays, Making Love with the Land. Currently, Whitehead is an assistant professor of English and Indigenous Studies at the University of Calgary. So as students in VIC 459, Creative Citizenship, The Here and How, we had the privilege of reading Whitehead's Making Love with the Land and discussed and learned from his unabashed commitment to exploring the intersections between philosophy and narrative. In describing his approach to writing of grief in his book, he said, I wanted it to be forgiving, forgiving of myself for wrongdoings I have done as a person, forgiving of the wrongdoings people have done against me, because to hold all of that is a gargantuan, impossible task. I needed to put grief and give it a body, 
give it a shape so I could literally put it down and put it to rest and pick it up when I want. And this just exemplifies one of the many ways in which Whitehead is a writer to be read and understood closely and with intentionality. Through musings such as this and books such as Making Love with the Land, we as writers came to better understand how approaches to creative citizenship are imbued in our work, like in our personal choices and expression, like in, our, in conveying our grief. We are very excited to welcome him to this panel today. Um, I'm saying to Mike, hi, my friends. <clears throat> I'm a little sick right now, as I was joking in the green room. So uh, pardon me if I sound like Ray Romano. Um, I also wanted to read something new um, from also from the Toronto International F Festival of Authors uh, commission piece, because I'm working on a new project. I'm trying to move away uh, from my other ones. Uh, so this one is entitled Shoot, Shovel um, and Shut Up which is also known as the 3S treatment as retaliation against an animal preying on livestock. It's also a popularized form of settler nationalism and anti-Indigenous rhetorics, uh, most prominently known, prominent about Golden Bushi and the 20, 2022 Saskatchewan stabbings. It's also in um, intertextual with Cormac McCarthy's The Road. As one, I am eulogiac. I first was invited to Rideau Hall in 2016. I won the Governor General's History Award for my poem, Miku Guanyi, which means rose in Cree. The senses overloaded, like the heated Valerian knife of Rhaenyra Targaryen that foretells the songs of ice and fire, I too stood ablaze in glyph and syllabic. They tell me that I sound ancient when I speak to you of the Algonquin. Velvet, oak, teak, cartilage, what an exhibition to be enveloped within. There is a photo of my mother and I wearing the same velvet draped around the Baroque, such profundity twisted up in the knots of our smiles. In another instance, a photo was taken of me in front of the portrait of Queen Elizabeth II, a pageant of class, hands in a prayerful stance. I have come to bury my grandmother. Quote, denied any history of their own, it was the fate of primitive peoples to be dropped out of the bottom of human history in order that they might serve representationally as its support, the point at which human history emerges from nature. And that comes from Tony Bennett's essay, The Exhibitionary Complex. Posited on the ledge of modernity and history, this hall is a tomb of conquest. A curation of story the nation tells itself to stratify, decadent and profane. I might dare you to entomb me, which isn't so much a dare as it is the truth of imperial ideology. Would my grandmother be carried with such ferocity and grace to her death chamber among her ancestors as Elizabeth was, who stood vigil at her autopsy table? Find a bell jar to house the almonds of our amygdala. Shoot, he proclaims in bush and vigilante. Pasquiskewin, which is the act of firing a shot or bullet, might be the shot I take to gift the murdered a space of remembrance. A headstone is a luxury. We hung our dead in trees, effigies of birch. All the trees in the world are going to fall sooner or later, but not on us. Pasque of the blanket of Taquayan, we are ready for our snow bath. The time for story and snag arrives. Gisik, the sky, look to her. I want for trees to fall upon us. Might this too be a vigil? Pakitin kimistik me al nimistikwan. Your body tree falls down on me or into my head. Bite into my bark the stories of revival. Crunch into the hard wood of this scaffold the prayers of sweat and stone, for all stones know a weeping song. Two, September 6, 2021, my uncle is struck by a car and dies instantly. June 15th, 2022, my last remaining maternal uncle is found dead on his bed. Both times I am in Toronto. Both times I am with a partner, although different. Both times I let mourning engulf me. 
I climb the CN Tower. Atop its needle, I light a cigarette. Emblazed, I pour across the city core dreams of wild tobacco and sweet smoke, become an arrowhead. Knocked, I bow into the sky and pierce the heart of a thunderbird, which is not to say I am deadly in my musings. I want to touch the thorax of God, nestle in her bone cage, sight creation in a thunderstorm. Spill from caruncle and divine rallies for these losses. I don't know if I see it all that often, that we've become our forebearers' dreams. I suppose we're walking contradictions and what beautiful metaphors we've become. I want to find beauty in the world and translate that into joyful storytelling. My published work up until this point in my life has become a eulogy for the dead my epigraphs of violent graphing. Do you think your fathers are watching that they weigh you in their ledger book? Against what? There is no book, and your fathers are dead in the ground, which is a quote from McCarthy. I am here again for my touring of making love with the land, a materialized formulation of my mental warrings. I share story with audience, it appears that they have learned from this new story, and yet I am racked with anxiety, struggle to catch my breath, sweat on stage, pores too crying. A publication is meant to be celebratory, and I lament. I find myself reading The Road again. I write into the margins. Papa, do you hear me too? And boy, might I take a turn at fathering. I just want to be beautiful. But you are, you already are, look at you. I don't mean beauty in the sense of skin. I can feel the pain of your histories when you speak to me. Why do you thank me for human decency? I wanna be a beautiful wreck site. I want to be beautiful in the sense that when I come across a wound, it emanates. Like when pain becomes not a beacon, but a blazing. I want the hurt to see in me a tenacity that overdefines the word harmed. I let his you become me. Can you do it? When the time comes, when the time comes, there will be no time. Hold him in your arms, just so. The soul is quick, pull him towards you, kiss him quickly. Such so, I have already done it. I have split the skull of nation with the rock and found not but a book to tax reconciliation and my name as deduction. Cormac is a catharsis. The abysmal grade book is enlightening to me. I want to know why. My body is a border between myself and the world, not a vehicle. That is the problem. Hi, hi, thank you. That was absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much, Josh, uh, for that reading. And thank you, uh, Billy Ray, as well. It was just absolutely, just mind-blowingly wonderful, always, to hear both of you read. And Josh, thank you so much for uh, for reading, uh, even while, while ill, but I thought you sounded fantastic. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, and I want to give like a huge thanks um, also to the students of, uh, of VIC 459 Creative Citizenship for incredible work on all of those uh, introductions. I'm super mega impressed. Um, so thank you. And also thank you to everyone who is uh, in here right now uh, and witnessing all of this. Thank you for uh, taking time on a Friday afternoon. And thanks also to uh, VIC College for, for hosting all of this. Um, so now uh, the students uh, who are in different groups um, have prepared a variety of questions uh, for the panel members. Um, and I'm just going to call upon the groups who have author specific questions to start us off. Yes, yeah, so um, our question is for Liz. Um, and our question is about the writing process. So how do you approach bringing together science and literature while you're writing poetry? That was an excellent question. Um, I would say that 
let's say there are a few different, uh, there are several approaches that my writing uh, sort of manifests manifests uh, through, but let's say uh, in terms of science and poetry, uh, there are two ways uh, in which the writing comes about. The first is I tend to do a lot of free writing or quote unquote automatic writing, a, a little bit of what I ask all of you to do in class sometimes when we have, when we have time. And I just let um, language flow through me. Sometimes I'm tapping into uh, language that seems to be coming from a, an entirely different place. Um, sometimes it feels as if I'm having to translate uh, full body sort of sensations uh, and impressions uh, into language. And I think oftentimes that results in some of the, the fissile and jargony and strange use of language um, in a lot of my uh, poems. Um, however, when I have uh, an idea of wishing to integrate something specific um, that's from the realm of science into my work, I will do a, a fair amount of research, background research um, into that topic. For example, the, you know, the, the cosmic bruise of um, the title, right, of my book, Letters in a Bruised Cosmos. It's an actual region of space that's uh, theorized to be um, the mark of a whole entire other universe colliding with our own uh, early in our universe's um, form, uh, formation. Um, and so it's the most, that interpretation and the evidence that it's based on is the, was at one time the most compelling evidence for um, multiple universes. Uh, and so of course, I tapped into the, the research on that and tried to read very advanced sort of astrophysics uh, articles. Um, but mostly what I was, interested in is uh, working working with the metaphor uh, as much as possible. Thank you so much for that great question, Natasha and Di. And now uh, group one, I think has a question. Yes. So hello, Billy Ray. I love your work. Um, I'm particularly uh, taken by what you say about um, motherhood uh, in a minor chorus. Um, and I just, I'd really love to hear you speak a little bit more to that. So um, as, as a gay man, why interpret your own reciprocal caregiving as mothering? Uh, what is the value of motherhood as you understand it? And what role might motherhood play in the formation of sovereign utopias? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so the moment when uh, motherhood comes up in the novel is the moment when the uh, protagonist is uh, confronted by his own inability to have a conversation with his mother about her past. And the character, the protagonist, realizes that he has to inhabit that silence uh, and, and, and continue on uh, in that the novel that he hopes to write can still be written even sort of without that information because that history is already inside him, you know, whether or not it's been expressed. And I think a lot of queer people, if I can speak generally, a lot of queer people figure out that um, they have to mother themselves, not just, you know, not just because of um, you know, childhood trauma, but sometimes because of that, but also uh, because I think to be, to be queer is to be in relation, um, in, in, you know, relationality with, with others and that, you don't ever sort of lose sight or it's never occurred to you that that's not the case. Um, and mothering ultimately 
you know, outside of a biologically essentialist frame is ultimately about, you know, tending to one another in ways that makes our, you know, our lives more possible. That's something that queer people do all the time. And I wanted to make space for, for that conversation in the novel. Wonderful, excellent. Thank you so much, um, Billy Ray. Um, and now, uh, group two, Sarah Angel, have a question. Um, yeah, so our question is for Joshua. Hello, very excited to be speaking to you kind of in the flesh, not quite in the flesh, but as close as we can get. Um, and so something that we've been grappling a lot with in our creative citizenship class um, is the concept of self-censorship. So for yourself as an indigenous queer writer who takes from your personal experiences, right, with your intersectional identity um, in forming the narratives that you create in your writing, um, we were just wondering if you've ever had to grapple yourself with feelings of self-censorship self in trying to create work that both honors your story um, and the stories that you want to create while recognizing that um, we live in a world that might not always be receptive to it, um, especially in the world of like literature and marketing and book people and th things like that. Um, and if so, what recommendations do you have um, moving forward for, um, you know, burgeoning artists as well who might be grappling with similar things? Excuse me, sorry. Thank you, that's a great question. I mean, nothing's more embarrassing than like reading a rimming scene in front of your family uh, at a book launch or a book, <laughs> something like that. So I have definitely had fair share of embarrassing moments <laughs> with family. But also too, in terms of censorship, let me just, I guess I'll speak, speak frankly about Making Love with the Land. Um, like, you know, it does, writing a book that's very, um, I would say vulnerable, I suppose, in spaces and in terms of thinking about myself and then thinking about um, the perhaps excavation work that it takes to, to write something like that in the form of auto fiction or uh, auto poetics which for me, I don't really kind of see a division of. Um, I don't really see that. I, I think all writing by BIPOC folks and, and or queer folks is in inherently um, biographical in a sense, or like bodies are like int intricately tied to the things that we create um, in, a, in such a way that, you know, we're always, there's always a gambit, I suppose I would say, to write and is always a cost of the writer to craft. Um, which I don't think a lot of people take into consideration. Like, you know, when I read, say, something by, um, uh, let's say, Catherine Hernandez, uh, I'm a guest to that, to that space and, and that, those pages as well. Mm -hmm. And I always try to enter into a book specifically from, you know, Black writers or trans writers and or any intersection thereof as like medicinal in a sense. And like it's treating it like a plant and I'm just taking off the top. I don't take the roots so that I can return to it. And then also trying to be reciprocal in the pages of the book as well in knowing the cost that it costs that writer to craft that and the continual cost it costs to read it and to share it and to be autopsied as we are kind of trained in academia to you know pull apart an essay or pull apart a poem or a narrative and like take that line and like this is the exact line I need to kind of make this argument. So it's a type of kind of violent undoing, I think, um, that we perhaps are consciously and unconsciously trained to do, uh, you know, as readers, as academics, you know, as editors or reviewers. And so my censorship really, I don't think I have a lot of censorship in my writing, um, just for the sake of being true to the stories that I want to tell. You know, when I wrote Johnny Appleseed, this little glitter diva here, uh, I originally wrote it as YA, young adult fiction, um, because I wanted to, you know, show representation and demonstrate myself as having vivacity um, and sexiness and being powerful in my queerness and my indigeneity braided together as wholly as one. And, you know, it was kind of treated as adult fiction. I still, the aesthetics of the book are very YA still. 
Um, but for the sake of, I think we're in a very political time, you know, as like TikToks being banned and, you know, drag shows are being targeted and queer spaces are completely uh, being policed and or protested against. Uh, and why, like, you know, large scale transphobia, specifically in the US, southern US, right? In that, you know, we have these idea, ideologies that queerness in whatever form it may take um, is irrational, is like demonized in a sense. And, you know, like I can turn on the television and watch six commercials back to back that will normalize heterosexuality, that will normalize whiteness, that will normalize the acts of heterosexual sex. And so I just, for me, the, the point of censorship is redundant to me um, because, you know, living my life as a, you know, a queer indigenous person, <laughs> like these things are normal, normal to me, like queer sex is messy, indigeneity is fraught, uh, and to put them together is, is a kind of, is profane and profound at the same time um, from a settler perspective. And so I just wanted to perhaps normalize that on the page and normalize that in literature. So it's not always ethnographic. And so it's not always like native reporting uh, of like, you know, my works being read as confession for <laughs> the fable of indigenous and Canadian history, but rather is showing the I would say very, very fraught contemporariness that we live within for the sake of continuation into brighter, beautiful, more sexy, more powerful indigenous literatures to follow. Um, so I kind of, maybe I just kind of see myself as in like an aggregate in the wake of all that. Excellent, thank you so much. And now each of the groups have prepared uh, sort of general uh, questions. So anyone in the panel uh, is invited to respond to them. So I'll invite uh, group four to start us off. So Brooke or Lisa. Yes, um, one of the questions that I had was, what is the biggest challenge you face today as a writer? I guess I would say, okay, Billy, you go first. <laughs> I was just going to say, I think hmm, there's so many different directions that we could take this question but I think I've been grappling with at this point in my career writing in conversation with my previous works without you know duplicating them or um absorbing them too entirely into what I'm doing now and there's also, you know, in my practice, which is social and political, figuring out how to sort of act, you know, make actionable the things I'm interested in writing about. So my in my poetry seminars that I teach at UBC. I frame the class as um, a class interested not just in the production of poetry, but in the work of living a poetic life. So it means that we can't just, you know, it, it isn't that we write and that has little, nothing to do with the world, but that we write in order, you know, to be free. And so a, 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 an ongoing challenge is precisely, you know, the, you know, working toward freedom. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Billy Bray. And I'll sort of like springboard off of um, what you offered, especially I'm interested and have also uh, tried to put into practice in my poetry classes, this notion, um, 
to quote uh, Dion Brand, who said, uh, you can't make a living writing poetry, uh, but poetry can make a life, right? Um, as the sort of lens, right, for viewing the world and as a, a kind of joyous, rebellious, um, and discerning modus operandi. Um, and I find myself uh, struggling to uh, be in that mode um, of living, uh, which then, of course, would uh, provide the necessary conditions uh, for, you know, creative uh, production that doesn't feel like one is just trying to wring blood out of a stone, which uh, is kind of the sensation for me uh, most evenings when I can sort of like get <laughs> the odd, you know, the odd hour and sort of like steal away um, and try and uh, conjure something interesting. Uh, so that is uh, a challenge. Yeah, like finding finding time and being able to what? Not compartmentalize, but I don't know, structure. Structure one's affects, I think, um, in a way that is self-preserving um, because there are, there's so many things uh, in the world that, that demand uh, labor and also a, a fair amount of, I don't know, effective labor, which for me is just sort of like, there's a lot of worry uh, and a lot of anxiety. Um, so I would say, yeah, that's one of the biggest challenges that I have. And also um, similar issues, like in terms of, yeah, how to make action, as you said, like how to make actionable the things that I'm wanting to write about. I'm in a similar sort of quandary um, in that I'm wanting to write about essentially like is, I suppose it's essentially like a speculative autobiography. Not that it's necessarily based uh, in, you know, the realm of like fantasy or science fiction, but it involves some sort of strange understanding of time authorship uh, and mortality that I haven't worked out myself. Um, so that is a challenge. I think I would just like echo both Liz and, and Billy. Um, one is I just, Liz, hearing you laugh made me miss how much I miss your kinship. Like I love your laugh. <clears throat> that was brings me such joy. And like to be again with Billy, I know we all live very busy, disparate lives across provinces. So it's nice to be together. So thank you for bringing us together. And I think like for me, I have like two challenges, um, like the number one challenge is like being a writer who's indigenous and queer or two spirit um, and or a woman and maybe you feel similarly Liz and Billy, but like the burden of representation that's put on our shoulders, uh, just for the sake of writing these books, <laughs> of like being the expert on two spirit I'm like no one's an expert it's like we're unearthing these things uh, as they've been in the, you know, in the sniper scope of colonialism and imperialism since 1492. Um, so it's I think it's a great deal of <laughs> representational labor that we take upon ourselves, being indigenous, being queer, you know, um, being que and being women as well. And that can also like I think plays a, a role uh, sometimes in maybe sense to return to the first question, censorship I place upon myself. Um, like, could I write a book that doesn't feature indigenous characters of, you know, people in Paris drinking tea and talking existentially? Would that be an indigenous book still because it's written by me? I think so. But uh, I think there's a different expectation from publishers. And I think the second one, um, <clears throat> I'm working with my agent, who I think might be our agents too, all of ours, uh, Cody Caetano, uh, Anishinaabe writer of Half Bads and White Regalia. Um, and... <laughs> Really making me laugh at the chat. Giovanni's room soon. And I have a hard time maybe moving out of the kind of 
large shadow that Johnny Appleseed has cast upon me um, in that I think all of my characters kind of sound similarly to him. And it's taken me a lot of undoing to be like, that's not Johnny's voice, that's Joshua's voice. And this was just like the vernaculars I use as a person, uh, you know, as an urban indigenous queer person, it's like a mixture. And so I'm trying to, I'm working on a new novel, which is speculative fiction. And I want to like write a, like my praxis is joy, I suppose, in writing. Um, and I've had to kind of unlatch the um, perhaps fuel tank that I have attributed to all of my books so far in that it's like bloodletting into these books and like giving them myself to kind of craft this character, right? Uh, this kind of transmutation that happens from personal memory or personal love or personal loss or joy, and I give it to these characters. I don't think that's ever going to go away. I think that's just a practice of being BIPOC and a writer. But at the same time, I'm trying to like move into a realm of writing that's purely based off of research creation rather than using kind of method acting as a form of um, narrative craft, right? So I think that's something that maybe comes naturally to people like, um, I don't know, <laughs> any white writer, maybe, um, Atwood, for example. But for me, it's just like, it's very difficult to kind of, you know, remove that kind of, that motor that's moving in between these. And so yeah, I think that's a difficulty that I'm learning and unlearning. And I think it's a strange practice that's taught in creative writing classrooms across the country, across like globally, maybe even, um, that we don't kind of speak about, again, like the cost, the cost, the writer to write, right? So I, that, that's kind of been the difficulties, I think, for me as a writer right now. Wonderful. And I invite group three to ask their panel-wide question. Yes, so um, Guy and my question is, uh, what, what does the name of this panel, Sovereign Utopias, mean to you and how do you think it relates to the work that you do in your writing? Okay, so I think I would describe my poetics as um, an invitation to readers to join in on the desire for another world. And I learned from Jose Esteban Munoz that utopia is not something out of reach, but rather something that we already practice in invisibilized and non-institutional ways that um, you know, traces of the utopian already inside us as, as queer people, as indigenous people, and so forth. And we, um, I feel like poetry in particular is how I sort of make that feeling uh, available to be felt by others. Even when it's an incredibly sad poem, <laughs> I think that there's, you know, there's still the, the, the fellow feeling um, means more than just shared sadness. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Billy Ray. And again, I'm going to sort of leap, leap off of uh, a, a bit of uh, what, what you've offered. I've always yeah, resonated with this idea or phrase, like an, another world uh, is possible. And I think it's something that made its way to me through I, through any number of readings, but like probably through um, like anarchist uh, channels. And it's something that I tried in a way to infuse into my latest work because it's, I mean, um, it op the, the book is taking under consideration two different notions of an, an, another word world or or the or an other world right uh, so there's like the cosmic bruise which might be evidence of another universe um and then throughout the book there's a reference to Bagana Gizik or the hole in the sky uh, which is a, a constellation uh, which is in fact like connected to the shaking tent ceremony and it's seen as like a portal a portal essentially uh, to the spirit world um, and I think for different, um, in different areas, uh, the constellation has uh, 
different uh, associations uh, and residences. But for writing uh, po poetry specifically, I feel like when I am writing, when I'm in that really good space of writing, I am so I'm tapping into uh, something uh, otherworldly and possibly utopian and sort of there's a desire to sort of immunitize something um, which um, to use another phrase really Ray that you said earlier um, that which can sort of make life um, more livable. Can you guys still hear me? Yeah. Okay. But you are, There's some, your screen is glitching. My yeah, I'm so sorry. I don't know what is going on with that. We can view it as <laughs> a celestial some kind of like ready-made video art of intervening. <laughs> Very cyberpunk, Josh says. Excellent. Yeah. So like I guess my work has like utopian uh, leanings. Um, and of course, uh, both uh, Josh and Billy Ray's work um, discuss utopia, uh, as well as this notion of sovereignty, uh, of self-determination, um, of this better, you know, sort of like um, better possible world's richness utopia uh, for, for everyone and for, you know, as Joshua has written for the, the, the kin, um, in communities that one is uh, accountable to uh, that all of that sort of possible futurity is sort of is rooted in the sovereignty uh, of the land. Definitely. I think for mine, I'm like very interested in like maintaining the prairies as a queer space. Um, like instead of having to flee to like Toronto or Vancouver um, or New York or San Francisco, like these queer these queer utopias that we think of, <clears throat> which have rainbow flags planted in indigenous ground, sometimes I take fault with. Um, and so, yeah, I, I really, I think like the prairies to me are very utopian, which is why I refuse to leave them. <laughs> I need to stay here. Uh, it's very grounding to me, I suppose. And, you know, I think in the work that I've tried, I've crafted so far, it's been, it has been primarily pr prairie centric in maintaining the rigidity of queerness in these spaces that are often deemed to ostracize queerness, right? Um, <clears throat> but I also come from Treaty One, uh, and I, I come from Pegasus First Nation, and I come from Winnipeg, which is, you know, the confluence of the Red and the Assiniboine, um, and is the birthplace of the return to spirit in 1990 from Anishinaabe elder Myra Laramie, and it is also a birthplace of post-contact nations, and for me, Treaty One and that confluence of the rivers is like the most ceremoniously sexy place and because it's a space where sex becomes ceremonious and becomes futuristic in that, you know, these people who's come together and we, we, we become the OG Cree or we become the Métis, right? Um, and so it's a space of kinship. It's a space uh, of kind of futurity, even as we kind of look to it to it historically, right? Which is not to say I romanticize it, but it is a space that I would say is a project uh, of future dreaming and future being, which for me is rooted in kind of the ideology uh, of two spirit, right? Or Mij um, Manitowag. And so like, that's why I'm so, I think I'm so very attached to it uh, as an identifier for myself that places me histor like, historically, and then also like ghosts me futuristically in that sense. And so like the I think the utopian for me comes from <laughs> looking backwards or like looking beneath or sometimes knowing that, you know, um, north, east, south and west aren't the only directions we have. We have upwards and downwards, too. Right. And I guess I would say like that is a project of knowing that there is additional or alternative or worlds. Right. Beside, below, above, uh, above us, which is like why we have stories of like Sky World or the Fourth World too, right? And that's very utopian to me, um, of, like knowing that the immaterial, because it's not material, does not mean it doesn't exist, right? Um, so I think it's just for me, it's just like wormholing, I suppose, in a very um, 
I guess, strategic and known place in space that is Treaty One. And then there's a known place, sorry, is a known history um, of this space as futuristic in a sense because of it, because it deploys sex as ceremony. Great, thank you. And I invite group one to ask their panel wide question. Hi, our, our question for everyone is um, inspired by sort of the main question of a minor chorus, but especially with what everyone has been saying, it, it very much applies. Um, how do you balance joy and grief when you're telling Indigenous stories? I always think of that um, Fred Moten quote where he says, like, if anyone wants to tell a story of um, like uh, sort of suffering and they only say, you know, talk about the sorrow, they miss all of the joy that exists against the grain of that sorrow and therefore you know, tell an incomplete account. So, you know, there's a, there's a simultaneity to joy and to grief that uh, we eclipse if we only zero in on the grief or the sorrow. I think that um, some days it's harder <laughs> to, to do that than others. And some days it's easy, but I'm always, I always think of like how joyful indigenous spaces are and like how much, how much laughter there is. And um, I think it's, you know, part of our, our job to as indigenous writers to you know, imbue that laughter into our work. I guess I might note too. Uh, so I teach an all indigenous class and we've been watching reservation dogs uh, to study as narrative. And, you know, like, I think we laugh and cry every episode almost. <laughs> but, you know, like we, we've come to come to this conclusion. Like, I think like, it's gonna be strange to say my brother-in-law is like, Josh, that's so effed up. Um, but I think like the most joy sometimes that one can have is at an indigenous funeral um, because there's so much laughter, there's so much <laughs> remembrance. And it's unfortunate that these are the kind of the times and spaces and places that we come together is around mourning and death. But I have never laughed harder than in a, at a funeral <laughs> with my aunties. And so like for me, it just kind of posits that, you know, humor is not just a coping mechanism, but it's like, like a healing technique at the same time. Um, and like they, they, they go and they go in tandem, right? I have, sometimes have to like humble myself that like too much joy is also a type of sickness. And I think like that practice comes for me from like Eve Sedgwick, uh, an affect theorist who like writes about paranoid reading and uh, a reparative reading. Paranoid reading meaning like it's kind of you're always kind of looking for the failure and reparative being you're looking for the, the kind of I'm just to kind of really kind of summate giving a summation but like looking for the joyful in it and I try to like translate that into paranoid writing and reparative writing uh in such a way that I think it's like full metal and digital my first book of poetry I think was very much paranoid writing which was fueled by anger uh and fueled by hate really uh and a desire for destruction which is what the book does uh as this kind of cybernetic trickster invades and infects the canon and I think it's very it's um how can I say this it's a divine miracle that we as indigenous peoples and then we as indigenous writers are not endlessly bound and connected to this kind of paranoid form of reading and writing. You know, when we live in a world where we're like, there's unearthing of children every day um, and there's ongoing colonization and imperialist forces working against like with Sowetan and the, the water protectors there, right? Um, it's a grace that you know, we can write with joy and humor and love and care and for me like that's a project that I am I've been trying to take on is this kind of form of reparative writing in that 
I'm not so much writing to, it is a dismantling, but it's a dismantling through kinship and affect and care more so than like a targeted bow or a knocked arrow. And I think, I think for me, that's a, that's the way I deal perhaps, you know, with mourning and grief and pain and loss is through that practice of writing as a means of rematriation to kind of forego repatriation and then kind of re reparation and repair work really. Um, so I, I've really been trying to imbue that. I think making love with the land, if I had to kind of give it a thesis, it was for reparative writing, right? Of the self, for the self, and as a kind of large, perhaps um, a meditation on forgiveness really. Incredible, incredible answers, Billy Ray uh, and Josh. And I would say, uh, yeah, I, in a way, I don't know, in a way that is immediately intelligible or explicit. Um, it could be said that maybe I struggle to strike that balance between joy and grief. However, foundationally, you know, this process of um, reconnection um, has uh, been at the root of my writing since I was very young. Um, in the process of writing and reconnection have very much been braided together uh, for me. So when I'm able to invoke, you know, indigenous uh, and specifically Anishinaabe ways of knowing uh, and Anishinaabe Muen, like the Ojibwe language into my work, I think it is, I see it as an act of joy and I see it as something as life um, affirming. Um, and in general, it is my hope that some of the cacophonous, um, incantatory, language uh, that I use in the manner in which I read uh, is read as something as joy, even though a lot of the subjects that I'm working with are difficult um, and occasionally, you know, come, come from the space of grief uh, and loss. But I think for me, the act of writing and um, the community um, that I've, that it's allowed me to be amongst and be accepted by is in a sense, um, uh, joyous and at least minorly restorative sometimes. Excellent question. Where are we? Are we at group one or group, group two? Group two. Yes. Um, so our question has kind of been covered a little bit here and there, um, but, you know, we've talked about your texts under this umbrella term sort of, of, of creative citizenship, and, you know, we, we've thrown around a lot of different, like, possible definitions, so we were wondering, like, if you were to try to define something um, as broad spanning as creative citizenship, how would you personally attempt to define that, um, and how would you say that maybe your own work would engage with that or not engage with that? I mean, okay, if I was going to attempt to define it, it's not something I've thought of. So I'm like very happy to be part of this with, uh, with Liz and, and you know, with the class, <laughs> it's me again, in that, <clears throat> um, so when, I, when I'm Johnny Appleseed won Canada Reads two years ago, um, and um, Gawanahre Devry Jacobs was defending it, in the final day, um, there was a, a moment in which Devery was like brought to tears, um, which I don't think were tears of sorrow, but rather joy in being able to proclaim herself, uh, you know, as Mohawk and as queer and put them together. Uh, and that was a very powerful and beautiful thing for me to see, um, you know, on national television, uh, national radio. But then it also just reminded me like the kind of power that a good story has and a good story can um, 
I would say, reconfigure ourselves uh, into knowing ourselves as inherently and as absolute as we are. Um, and so I really, uh, that's something that I'll never, I'm gonna hold, I think, for the rest of my life uh, is that moment. And so for me, I would say creative citizenship comes in the form of a story that recognizes, but also a story that affirms, really. Uh, and I think that for me, it comes from a space of like not wanting to adhere to form or genre. And in fact, and seeing them as perhaps redundant borders. I always say to myself, like, if I'm going to be decolonial on the land, I need to be decolonial on the page too. And genre and form are borders to that, um, which can often, like, they romanticize or they infantilize Indigenous stories as speculative or fantasy. <laughs> when we tell stories of Thunderbirds or tricksters, um, it also reads our stories as uh, inherently autobiographical or confessional and specifically that's heightened by um, the truth and reconciliation era that we find ourselves in that everything's kind of an act of witnessing uh, when in fact we're just writing fictional novels <laughs> we're writing poetry right I'm not writing for the sake of adding to the oeuvre um, of you know Canada's um, <laughs> large tome of indigenous peoples and so for me like the I need I think I'm critic like the stories themselves become sovereign in that way in, in that they are written as the story needs to be written as it ought to be written which may become an amalgamation or you know a mutation of various different forms and genres that come to play in telling the story of someone like Johnny Appleseed or uh in coming to play into a book like Making Love with the Land um, so for me, yeah, I kind of need to be to like work and act as a hybrid to create citizenship in the story that affirms for, you know, the communities of which I am a part and write for and, you know, love and care for, which is, you know, queer Indigenous communities, Indigenous women and Indigenous peoples writ large. Um, yeah, so creative, creative citizenship, you know, the auspice under which we are all gathered. Uh, I see creative citizenship, you know, as being multifaceted. You know, I see it um, as both, you know, a possible lens and interpretive framework in terms of like how, you know, works are, are received or, you know, how we view ourselves as um, a reader or an audience. Um, but also as a potential praxis um, and mode of being in the world, all of which uh, would involve like a, an a, a deep attunement to, um, you know, socio-political and historical uh, conditions, right? Um, under which works may be produced, including, you know, who, um, the audience, the quote unquote intended audience of a work may be, um, and that of, you know, the author uh, themselves. I also view it as um, an invitation to create spaces that are more um, celebratory uh, in their uh, aims of, a, you know, of inclusion and, and representation. Um, and also, you know, spaces that are characterized by, uh, by care and warmth and uh, mutual celebration, uh, as opposed to, you know, rigid, you know, hierarchies and, you know, received notions about uh, what good, you know, what good writing is or what good art is, right? Um, in terms of how I see my own work, as stemming from creative citizenship, I had an answer in my head and it's mostly sort of flown out of there. Um, but certainly I've tackled, you know, an idea of citizenship directly, like in my first book, like the title is Infinite Citizen of the Shaking Dent. And, and by that, I was sort of discussing, you know, being, um, a kind of operator or having a kind of like sovereignty, absolute sovereignty within the realm of language itself um, and its infinite sort of 
of recombinatory potential um, and also um, one that is connected to uh, the, the beyond human or more than human uh, realm. And also in my work, I've written, you know, about, you know, a, a number of topics, you know, such as, you know, like the journey to um, reconnection, but also about, you know, childhood poverty uh, and abandonment, grief, um, and violence, uh, having contact with the legal system, um, and also mental health. And I know that um, my work has, in fact, touched people uh, in important ways because, you know, they'll come up uh, and tell me about it at readings or they'll, you know, they'll send me um, messages and notes um, saying about how much they relate to what I had written or that I was able to put into words what was difficult for them to sort of articulate even to themselves or that um, it was a positive experience for them to feel their own experience represented and reflected back to them. Excellent question. Uh, and in closing, uh, and we may have a few minutes after this to take a question or two from the audience, but I invite uh, group four to close us off in terms of class uh, panel-wide question. Yes, um, the last and final question that I have today is, how does your writing benefit the young adult and university community? I can start. I feel like um, university students are one of my, you know, key readerships, <laughs> um, which maybe is partly a reflection of the fact that I wrote, you know, most of these books when I was a university student, um, and also the fact that I've never left university. <laughs> As in, I mean, you know, I've been in various in universities throughout the course of my adulthood. Um, um, when I get asked how I became a poet or when I became a poet, I always tell the same story about, you know, being an undergrad and feeling the enormity of history for the first time and seeing how it shaped, had shaped my life and my family's lives. And that poetry seemed like the only method to grapple with it that didn't crush me or that wouldn't crush me. And I sort of luckily stumbled onto poetry on the internet and then started writing my own. And uh, I think that that sort of spirit or that energy is alive in my books. And I think that that spirit and energy is alive in all of you and, and, and so many young people. Um, and that, that can be channeled, you know, for good toward that project that I mentioned already of, you know, imagining and insisting on our freedom. Um, so I taught uh, Billy's a minor course in my graduate course last year, last term. <clears throat> um, and you know, I had to text, text Billy and be like, um, I don't know if I should be teaching a minor course because this is about like leaving and fleeing academia. And I'm gonna have like an exodus of graduate students being like, this place is effed up, let's get the hell out of here <laughs> and let's become artists. Um, it actually went really well and was really beloved. And I guess like, I also have never left university. Uh, I've only had one year off of school my whole life uh, in which I worked at Subway and it was a terrible time. Um, I, was, I had to go to like Subway University, it was strange, but I won't get into the rhetorics of Subway right now. Um, I think like the role of academia and the students inherent within it are like very necessary for any and all decolonial work that we want to do. Because we need the theories uh, of Munoz, you know, we need this, this like theories of Butler and Deleuze and Guattari, and we need Foucault, uh, and we need these. But again, I think like the 
I can't go home and like tell my grandmother. I'm like, you know, the, the necropolitics of this nation state and the imperial forces it used. She's going to be like, what the hell are you talking about? But she is a theorist in that sense because she has that embodied knowledge. She has like what Dion Million calls like felt theory too, right? And so like, I think it's so important that, you know, we have, we, do, we are like philosophical thinkers, we're critical thinkers. Um, but for me, it's like kind of moving into like as a graduate student now, as a professor, it's like eat up all of these theories and then like expunge them in narrative. And I think like we all do that. And like that's when the power of academia and graduate students, I, I think do this very beautifully and excellently is that when you can take that and you can take, <laughs> you're talking about necropolitics and biopower, and you're talking about, you know, cruising utopia, and you're talking about um, gender failure and gender theory, and you put that into something um, like this wound is a world or, you know, the, the bruised cosmos or Johnny Appleseed, it's like our communities are learning these things of which they know all we're doing is just giving them the language. And that language is for me takes the form of character. Um, so I, I think it's paramount and fundamental that, you know, we have these spaces and that we that we have the knowledges that they have access to. And then we kind of use that uh the, we make it accessible through narrative or through the poetics uh and i think that's like a mandate that i've always kind of upheld and maintained since becoming a university student wonderful excellent answers um i would say quickly i mean i hope it is it is a value i hope my work is a value uh, and is a benefit uh, uh, to uh, the academic world in the university system. Um, I've certainly, you know, found myself uh, a sort of a guest uh, within it, uh, for which uh, I'm very grateful. And I would say, in generally, like my work um, might be doing something interesting because it, you know, it invokes and braids together. Uh, you know, Western science, varieties of Western science and thought with, um, you know, poetry as a, as a, a language art, uh, and also uh, indigenous knowledges and, uh, and ways of knowing um, in a non-hierarchical uh, way. And it shows that all these different ways of approaching um, the world uh, can be fruitful um, and valid. I would say. And perhaps we have a, no, no time, I don't think, for um, questions from the audience, or maybe one, maybe one question. First person who pops one into the chat. Adam asks, um, how glad are you guys that I invited you to this panel? I feel like we're at, you know, I had Liz uh, <laughs> give a, a lecture in my class in the fall. Um, yes, yeah, that was wonderful. That was great. I, I, I enjoyed it very much. And I've had Josh speak in my class and I've spoken to Josh's class. I feel like this is just going to be our lives for the rest of our <laughs> <laughs> careers. <laughs> Definitely be like ping pong uh, between classes, but I'm very happy um, now that Liz and like Victoria College had us. Um, it's uh, it's an unfortunate that we all get to be in a room together uh, and we all get to be in our indigenous baddie self, maybe to quote Cody Caetano, <laughs> together. Um, I was like woefully sick last night and I was like, I don't think I'll make it. And then this morning I just got this like nasal steroid <laughs> that keeps leaking. That's why I keep going off camera. But I'm so happy I was able to muster the energy to join. Uh, and I just want to say like thank you to, to Billy, uh, to Liz and to all of you who came tonight uh, or today. Um, it's really invigorated me and I'm leaving um, with some quotes that I think I want to I will discuss with you at later points, but I'm feeling really invigorated um, really energized, and I definitely needed this on a sick bed. So thank you all. 
Oh, excellent. And thank you so much, uh, Joshua and Billy Ray. It was absolute, an absolute delight uh, to have you both present. And thank you for agreeing um, to, to do this with me. Uh, I want to thank also uh, Adam Saul and Emily Fu of Victoria College, who have been doing uh, some wonderful um, uh, behind the scenes uh, running of things and support. And I'd like to thank uh, and congratulate uh, my wonderful students on an incredible event. I'm so blown away, uh, so filled with joy um, and so deeply appreciative of the, the brilliance uh, that you brought uh, to today's session. And thank you, thank you generally to everyone who was able to uh, attend today. And I believe at some point uh, a recording of this event will be made available uh, through Victoria College. So I'm sure we'll, uh, make that knowledge uh, apparent at some point. Okay, great. All right, you are released. Enjoy your Friday. Chimaguach.